Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the major mechanism of cannabinoids, specifically the mechanism that has to do with reduction in pain. That's what we're going to focus on here. So first of all, let's define what a cannabinoid is. So cannabinoids are small molecules, they're neurotransmitters, uh, some of which are synthesized inside the body endogenously, others are administered or taken exogenously, and they're molecules that really serve to do two major things. They're going to regulate neuron function, which is what we're going to focus on here, and they also play some roles in reducing inflammation, so they are intrinsically anti-inflammatory. The first class of cannabinoids are those that are made naturally via biosynthetic pathways by your own cells. These are called endocannabinoids, and there's really two major ones. The first one has the abbreviation 2-AG. That's this molecule right here. This is called 2-arachidonoyl glycerol. It's derived from arachidonic acid. There's another one abbreviated AEA. This is anandamide, also derived from arachidonic acid. They are made by your own cells. There are also what we can call exocannabinoids. These are typically the cannabinoids that you would have in marijuana or some other source like CBD oil. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. But those are going to be cannabidiol, also abbreviated CBD, and then also the infamous tetrahydrocannabinol THC, which is only legal in certain states and to varying degrees. We'll come back to these in a little bit. But we're going to focus on the mechanism of how these cannabinoids are going to reduce the perception of pain. So we're going to imagine a situation right here where on the right side, here is a presynaptic neuron. On the left side, this is a postsynaptic neuron. And so the information is traveling, in this case, from right to left. Right. And we're going to assume that information that's being uh, propagated uh, between these two neurons is pain. So when we have a painful stimulus, we're going to have an action potential that's running down this axon of the presynaptic neuron. And we know, hopefully at this point, that action potentials running down the axon eventually will trigger the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels in the terminal button of this axon. So calcium will be influxing into this cell from the extracellular fluid out here to the intracellular in here. We are not actually going to have potassium efflux, uh, so potassium is going to actually for now remain inside the cell. But we have calcium influx. And when we have calcium influx, that's going to depolarize the membrane of the cell. It's going to depolarize the membrane right here, and that's going to trigger neurotransmitter release into the synaptic cleft. And specifically, the neurotransmitter that's going to be released by most neurons that are going to be propagating the perception of pain is glutamate. So this glutamate is released by the presynaptic neuron. It's going to diffuse across the synapse, and it's going to bind to a glutamate receptor. So this receptor right here is a glutamate receptor. It's situated in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. So when glutamate is exocytosed from the presynaptic neuron into the synaptic cleft, the glutamate is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient towards the postsynaptic neuron. And it's going to bind to this receptor right here. This is actually a glutamate receptor. And when the glutamate binds to this receptor, that's going to trigger an, an initial depolarization of this neuron. And so then you'll get an action potential that's in going down uh, this axon right here. And that's going to give you pain. That's the first thing that happens. Because if we have a stimulus that is going to cause us to perceive pain, we need to have the action potential from the presynaptic neuron be transferred to an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So that makes sense. But there's another thing that also happens, and this is the focus of this video. We're also going to have the release of endocannabinoids. So first of all, let's talk about how they're released and then why. So ultimately, when glutamate binds to this receptor, it's going to activate a series of three enzymes. This first one, PLC, this is phospholipase C. So phospholipase C is an enzyme that you may have seen in a biosignaling topic in biochemistry. It's going to take this uh, membrane lipid called PIP2, or PIP2. That stands for phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Normally, for obvious reasons, we abbreviate it PIP2. Phospholipase C is going to break that apart into two things. One is IP3, 
and IP3 is uh, a second messenger that will go inside the cell and do various things. Uh, one of those things is trigger calcium uh, into the cytosol. But the major thing here is that we also get this molecule called diacylglycerol, abbreviated DAG. This DAG that's generated by the action of phospholipase C is just going to kind of stay in the membrane, okay, because it's still hydrophobic, and it's going to recruit this protein called DAG-L, okay, and DAG-L is going to come up here and become activated. DAG-L is an enzyme called diacylglycerol lipase. Right. It's going to take DAG and further lipolyze it into this molecule 2-AG. Right. This is called 2-arachidonoyl glycerol. This is our first endocannabinoid. And once this endocannabinoid is generated by DAG-L, or diacylglycerol lipase, that 2-arachidonoyl glycerol, or 2-AG, will be transported out into the extracellular fluid. And we'll look at the function of that in a couple minutes. There's another enzyme here, PLD. This is phospholipase D. This is going to take a unique molecule called NAEP, which stands for 2-N-acyl phosphatidylethanolamine, and it's going to convert this into AEA, also called anandamide. And out of these two, anandamide is usually the most uh, recognized endocannabinoid. But in any case, whenever PLD forms anandamide from NAEP, this anandamide, like the 2-AG, is going to be transported out into the extracellular fluid and these two molecules are actually going to bind over here to this receptor that's on the presynaptic neuron called CB1. This is a cannabinoid receptor. Now, looking here, when 2-AG and anandamide come over here and bind to the cannabinoid receptor, there's two things that happens. Okay? One, it stimulates potassium efflux. Okay, so this stimulates potassium efflux right here. And the other thing that it does is it actually inhibits the calcium influx. Well, let's think about what effect each of these things independently would have on the membrane of this presynaptic neuron. If I stimulate potassium efflux, that would cause hyperpolarization of the membrane because potassium is moving out and the inside of the cell becomes relatively more positive. So I'm hyperpolarizing the membrane. If you were to inhibit the calcium influx, then calcium can no longer come into the cell, so you're inhibiting depolarization. So this does two things. One, it inhibits depolarization, and two, it stimulates hyperpolarization of the membrane of this presynaptic neuron. And so overall, you have hyperpolarization. Now let's think about what that hyperpolarization would do. Well, that hyperpolarization would actually stop the pain signal, or at least would attenuate it to some extent. But why would we want that? Because we had a, a, a painful stimuli, we want to perceive pain. It occurs because you don't want that pain stimulus to keep going up and up and up or to continue indefinitely. That would be really bad. Okay? What we want is we want some pain and we want to dial it back okay? so that we don't feel that pain indefinitely or for it to keep increasing in magnitude. So in addition to the postsynaptic neuron initially uh, feeding towards the central nervous system to give you the perception of pain, we also at the same time release some endocannabinoids which are going to modulate that pain signaling by acting on the CB1 receptor or the cannabinoid receptor on the presynaptic neuron membrane. And that's going to decrease uh, the release of glutamate ultimately by uh, stimulating hyperpolarization and inhibiting depolarization. All right? And the major purpose of that is so that the pain signal doesn't get out of control. And keep in mind that in order to get the release of glutamate right here, this membrane has to be depolarized. And so that's why we have the calcium influx from the initial action potential. But if we inhibit this calcium influx and stimulate potassium efflux, then less and less glutamate is going to be released. And this is a this is more or less a, 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 st a stimulus that we can have in a graded fashion. So we can have varying amounts of glutamate release. It's not necessarily an all or nothing uh, phenomenon here. Okay, but the point is is these endocannabinoids are going to feed back on the endocannabinoid receptor, or just the cannabinoid receptor, and they're going to decrease the release of glutamate, which is going to attenuate the pain response. Okay? 
Now that's extremely important because we can actually use the cannabinoid receptor, the CB1 receptor, as a therapeutic target in order to reduce pain. And actually this is precisely what CBD is used for. So actually I mentioned uh, that we have two exocannabinoids. These are not biosynthesized by your body. These are actually made in plants, uh, such as the marijuana plant. And marijuana in general has two major exocannabinoids. One of them is the psychoactive form. This is the one that most people associate with the drug use. This is tetrahydrocannabinol, or its full name, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, abbreviated THC. The other one, which is more benign in nature and is actually legal in all 50 states is cannabidiol or CBD. And so if you ever see CBD oil, uh, that's going to be an oil that has a significant amount of CBD in it, but very minimal, in fact, negligible amounts of THC. Okay. Um, and so the reason we can use these therapeutically is because cannabidiol and THC, if we're being really technical, can actually bind weakly to the CB1 receptor. Okay. And so what can happen in that case is, for example, CBD, cannabidiol, is going to bind to the CB1 receptor, and that's going to do the same thing that 2 glycerol and anandamide did on the previous slide. They trigger the activation of the potassium channel, but they inhibit the influx of calcium. They're going to do the same thing. They're going to stimulate efflux of potassium, which would tend to cause hyperpolarization, and this will inhibit the influx of calcium, which inhibits depolarization. And so combined, the net effect is you have hyperpolarization of this membrane, which, which leads to diminished glutamate release by this presynaptic neuron. And so if you have diminished glutamate release, then there's not as much glutamate, or if any, binding to this glutamate receptor, and so there's little to no action potentials, and so no pain. And so this is kind of the basic mechanism right here as to how cannabidiol is actually going to be able to relieve pain. Put a little bit of a flow chart up here. We have CBD activating CB1, that's this receptor. Net hyperpolarization of the presynaptic neuron, which causes less glutamate release and then decreased pain perception. Okay, actually I'm expelled that right here, but I think you get the idea. And a little bit of the differences between cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol are illustrated in this table right here. THC is the psychoactive ingredient. Notice that CBD is non-psychoactive. Okay? Uh, you've probably heard THC gives you the munchies. It's an appetite stimulant and it tends to promote drowsiness. Um, THC is actually slightly stronger in its analgesic effect, meaning its pain relief effect, but it does exhibit some side effects such as potentially paranoia and anxiety, okay? although usually these are pretty minuscule side effects. CBD, on the other hand, has a lot more therapeutic targets, such as the fact that it's neuroprotective. It's anticonvulsant and it behaves as an antioxidant, so it's able to scavenge for free radicals. Technically, THC can do this as well. If you notice, you have this aromatic ring right here, so if it ties up a free radical in there, it neutralizes the free radical. And so it can help protect against the effects of inflammation. It's anti-inflammatory. It's also anti-tumoral. In fact, there have been studies that have shown that CBD, while it's not completely effective of totally eliminating a tumor, or cancer, it's very therapeutic in at least slowing the cancer down and even helping reduce it with combined with other therapies. Okay? So CBD is extremely therapeutic and actually what we're seeing right now is there are trials, not yet in humans, but very successful trials in animal models that show uh, several of these things as utilities of CBD. Now, one thing I wanted to mention before concluding this video is there's a little bit extra detail here that I didn't include that's a little bit irrelevant, but I wanted to make sure to cover it. Um, whenever glutamate diffuses across the synapse here and activates this glutamate receptor, there's actually a couple different kinds of receptors. Uh, we can either have an, um, an inotropic glutamate receptor or a metabotropic glutamate receptor. In either case, we either have calcium influx or a G protein as being the direct activator of these three enzymes, phospholipase C, diacylglycerol lipase, and phospholipase D, although the net effect is the same. And then when we activate the cannabinoid receptor, technically the, uh, the effects on the potassium channel and the calcium channel are due to the levels of cyclic AMP. So really whenever the 
uh, cannabinoid receptors activated, we have an inhibitory G protein that inhibits the enzyme adenylate cyclase, or AC. Adenylate cyclase, recall, normally converts ATP into cyclic AMP. This should actually say ATP. Um, and so if we inhibit this enzyme, we're going to drop the levels of cyclic AMP. And so when levels of cyclic AMP drop, that's going to be what actually triggers the activation of the potassium channel and the inhibition of this calcium channel. But in any case, I hope this mechanism of pain transduction right here as it relates to the CB1 receptor makes sense, and hopefully you learn how we can actually use CBD as a potential therapy for the treatment of pain. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.